In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You ever think about what's not in the Bible? Throughout the Old Testament, we have these wonderful glimpses. Every once in a while, you'll read something that says, and the rest of the things that this guy did, isn't that in this other book? And if you look around in your Bible, that other book isn't there. And you think, oh, what did we lose? And I'm sure that Jesus said any number of mundane things to his disciples through the years. I mean, after all, Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth like any other real human being. Most of his everyday conversations weren't seen as important enough to be recorded. Nowhere in the Gospels do we read that Jesus said, has anybody seen my other sandal? <laughs> or, hey Thomas, please pass the salt. But in today's Gospel, we hear of a post-resurrection appearance. And it's one of those interesting things to question if you imagine following Jesus around as one of his disciples, hearing all of his things, both mundane and inspiring, and he dies and comes back, what do you expect to see when he comes back? Is he shimmering somehow? Is he ghostly? Is he just like you and me? What does he look like in that situation? One of the interesting things about the gospel this morning is we learn that he's hungry. He's going to have breakfast. My favorite version of this, at least one verse of it, in, uh, of this story is in the chapter of Luke. And in that version, there's this one verse that I have used with youth groups forever. And if you've ever been the parent of a teenager, you might as well put this on a t-shirt. This is the youth group mantra. Gospel of Luke. Chapter 24, verses, verse 41, Jesus said, do you have anything here to eat? <laughs> this morning on the third Sunday after Easter, we hear yet another post-resurrection story. One major theme for Jesus as he appears to his followers after his resurrection is fairly simple. This is real. Here I am. I'm no ghost. Remember last Sunday's gospel, touch, feel, see that I am real. Further proof of Jesus' realness is the fact that he feels a bit peckish after dying, dying and rising a few days later. I'd say he deserves a snack, don't you? So the fact that Jesus is there, really there in flesh and blood, with the munchies to prove he's not some sort of ghost, points to a real bodily resurrection. Jesus wasn't an apparition, a projection, a mirage, or a dream. He was real. His birth was a real birth. His death, a real death. And his resurrection was a real resurrection. His birth was a real birth, and so he was a real man. His death was a real death, not a pretend death, a partial death, or a show. He died. And his resurrection was a real resurrection. And through his resurrection, ours will be real as well. Years ago, some Christian bookseller came up with this great idea, or at least he thought it was a great idea, the Jesus doll. It's about yay big. It's plush, it moves around, it kind of looks like he has dreads on, has the off-white robes with a red sash. It looks like you would expect Jesus to look like the Jesus doll. And at the time, I was appalled. It seemed so tacky, so unepiscopalian, if you will. <laughs> but many churches, including the one I grew up in, took up the idea and would buy one for the congregation. Imagine in the back of a church, instead of a soft space perhaps where kids can enjoy themselves and have maybe a stuffed bear or whatnot, stuffed Jesus doll. Each week, a different person would take Jesus home with them. It started with the children taking turns 
They'd bring him home. They'd strap him into the car seat, introduce him to the family pets. Parents soon reported that they found their kids talking to Jesus one-on-one. Bedtime prayers became personal. Jesus was invited to tea parties. In other words, Jesus became a real presence in their everyday lives, and the children shared Jesus with friends and family. Some worried that the Jesus doll would become some sort of idol, that the children would be confused about the stuffed Jesus compared to the real Jesus. As we know, a child's mind is, of course, more sophisticated than an adult's mind. Imagine a child clinging to a Mickey Mouse doll they play with every day, meeting the six-foot-tall one in Disney World. Wait, you're Mickey, but this is Mickey. That, what? They don't say, Mother, Father, I have come upon an existential conundrum. Kids figure that out a lot better than we give them credit for. The Jesus doll started to go home with adults, particularly those who had just suffered a loss. And they reported having him in their homes gave them a focal point to their prayers, a real comfort in times of trouble. And as you might expect, the Jesus doll became a favorite at the nursing home. When you talk to Jesus as if he was sitting there in the corner or next to you on the couch, it seems so much more intimate, so much more real. Lacking a Jesus doll to take home with you, I invite you to think about how you pray. Make it personal. Make it real. Not pretty words to an intellectual construct, but heartfelt prayers to a God with whom we have a real relationship. A retired colleague of mine worries that continually using Christ in our prayers might keep him at arm's length. Praying to Jesus instead might be just what we need to keep our prayers intimate, personal, real. Today we have a celebration of our Right 13 folks. It is a movement. They will start here with their parents and families, and at the end they will be over with the youth group. I thank you who have given up your seats who usually sit there for being willing to go somewhere else. But that's also something we do that is real. It's about real relationships. Just as when we baptize, it is a real baptism, establishing, as the prayer book declares, a bond with God that is indissoluble, a real child, a real adult, a real sacrament, a real bond forever. We will later celebrate the sacrament of Eucharist, partaking in the real presence of Jesus, joining us with God, the Father, through the Holy Spirit. Teresa of Avila once said, place yourself in the presence of Christ. Don't wear yourself out thinking. Simply speak with your beloved. Delight in him. Lay your needs at his feet. Acknowledge that he doesn't have to allow you in his presence, but he does. There is a time for thinking and a time for being. Be with him. I hope you go home with a lot to think about today. But as we baptize, reaffirm our baptisms in the right 13 service, as we anoint the sick, as we marry, as we repent of our sins, as we confirm, as we ordain all of those sacraments, as we break the bread and share the cup, I invite you just to be in the presence of Christ, the real you in the real presence of Jesus.